I don't think I need to bother with a long introduction. You all saw the title of the video. I already got my impressions video on this game up, but since then I've beaten the game and a lot of my opinions have since then changed. I said I was going to do a full review and that is exactly what I am here to do in this video. As you can easily see from the footage on screen, Persona 5 Tactica is a turn-based tactical RPG, not unlike XCOM, Mario plus Rabbids, and Gears of War Tactics. You and the enemies can hide behind cover that will either reduce or block incoming damage depending on where you're being attacked from, and what with. Guns are going to be your primary means of attack, but you also have your melee attack, and of course, your personas. Although, here they're not as gameplay defining as you might think. For one thing, skills are much more SP costly than they are in the main series, and your sub-personas can only have up to two skills at a time, and their base skills you can't even get rid of. Granted, there are many ways to restore your SP easily, but even by using skills that let you save SP, if you just go into battle spamming magic attacks, you're gonna run out pretty quickly. And yes, you heard me right, this game brings back the sub-persona system from the Q series. You have your sub-persona skill pool on top of your base personas, and you'll be unlocking new skills for your base persona through the game's skill tree system. What Persona 5 Tactica does to separate itself from other strategy RPGs like it, aside from what I've already mentioned, is with its one more system, where whenever you land a critical hit, you get another move, just like in the main series games. However, instead of getting rewarded for exploiting the enemy's weaknesses, you can only rely on critical hits, and what determines whether or not you get a critical hit depends on the position of the target. Enemies that are standing in the open will always be susceptible to critical hits, while enemies that are behind cover will always take reduced damage from guns, but if they're hit by a physical or magic attack, their guard will be broken and they'll be open to critical hits. Plus, whenever you do successfully land a critical hit, you'll be able to perform a triple threat attack, where if the enemy you just knocked down is surrounded by all your allies in a triangle shape, you can unleash a powerful attack against that enemy and any other enemies within that range for no cost. It's basically this game's version of an all-out attack, and in most cases, it's going to be your best means of taking out the enemies, but not always. Sometimes doing one may require you to leave your party members vulnerable to enemy attacks next turn, sometimes it may interrupt your strategy by requiring you to separate party members that have been working together, although even with these caveats, sometimes it might still be worth it. And that's what makes strategy games like this fun. You can experiment with all kinds of different builds and strategies for your party too. While the sub-personas only being able to have two skills is somewhat limiting, it's also oddly satisfying when you're still able to get creative and create a strong build with what limited options you have. One downside though is that when you do find a good strategy, upgrading your personas won't be as easy because with you being unable to change a persona's base skill, unless you're able to find a better alternative, you won't be able to upgrade personas very often. I ended up sticking with my personas a lot longer than I normally do, but it's actually not a terrible way to go because your personas do still level up. And besides their skills, the only bonuses that they provide are small boosts to HP, SP, and gun and melee damage. Now, throughout the majority of my playthrough, I stuck to a gun-focused party, with Joker and Yusuke having skills that increase gun damage. This, combined with Yusuke's guns having superior range, he makes for a great sniper. And then there was the MVP of my team, Haru, who is a freaking monster. Not only do her grenade launchers do much more damage than most other characters' guns, but they deal splash damage allowing them to hit multiple enemies at once, and her special ability increases the power of her already strong melee attack. The only downside is that her mobility is inferior to the other characters, but if you know how to make use of extra turns, this won't be an issue. This was pretty much my team until the end of the run, but for a good chunk of the game, I also used Arena. Arena is unique in that she can't use a persona, but she makes up for this with her superior mobility and her Flag of Freedom skill, which covers a large area and heals all allies while forcing all enemies out of cover for three turns. And it's perfect for stacking extra turns and setting up triple threat attacks. I also use Makoto as a backup, which, yes, Baton Pass is in this game, although you can only swap out party members when one of them dies, and the number of passes that you get per battle depends on your difficulty. I was playing on Merciless, so I only got one, but that actually brings me to my first complaint. Don't get me wrong, Persona 5 Tactica is a fun game with a lot of strategy and fun combat. But there's one problem. It's too easy. It's not as bad as Persona 5 Royal, but... There were hardly any times where I felt like I was really being pushed to my limits. In fact, I don't think I ever got a game over a single time due to my party being wiped out. Every time it was due to me running out of turns or failing to meet whatever condition was required. 
I never had to grind either. Heck, I didn't even know you could until I randomly decided to check the replay tab in the menu right before the final boss. The universal level bar definitely helps alleviate the need for excessive grinding. That being said, in addition to just completing the mission, you also have optional objectives you can complete. Usually those being completing the mission without losing any party members and finishing within a certain number of turns. I'm not exactly sure how or if this has any impact on your rewards at the end of each mission, but seeing those little check marks at the end of each mission is rewarding enough, and it provides another layer of challenge to what is an otherwise easy game. And if you make completing these challenges in every mission one of your goals, then Persona 5 Tactica actually can be quite a difficult game, and that's to say nothing of the optional quest missions. There are optional missions you can do that usually give you rewards in the form of GP for completing, and these missions are designed to be more like puzzles. They have the same alternate objectives that the main missions occasionally do, like getting objects to the end, getting one or more of your party members to the end, but usually there are caveats like completing them in just three, two, sometimes even one turn. And I found these missions to be the most fun because you really have to understand the mechanics of the game and be really meticulous when making use of your press turns to get through them. And some of them took me quite a few tries and I had to get pretty clever to get through them. One thing I'm not a big fan of in this game is how it handles money. It seems this is something Mega Ten games just can't ever get right. You have games that don't give you anywhere near enough money and force you to grind for hours to get what you want, and then you have games that just shower you with endless amounts of money, more than enough for you to get everything you could possibly need or want, and still have millions to spare by the end of the game. Tactica falls into the latter category, but here it's not because the game gives you too much, it's because there's just not a whole lot to spend your money on. There's the weapon shop and the compendium. That's it, and personas in the compendium are dirt cheap, and weapons get added to the shop very rarely, and you can only get guns now, mind you, no melee weapons. And halfway into the game, you unlock the ability to forge weapons in the Velvet Room, and this pretty much makes the shop obsolete. Now, I will say, and this is something I've seen a lot of XCOM fans and other fans of games in this genre point out, is that the level design is a bit... I don't want to say bad, but basic. Not in terms of how the levels play, I mean, there are plenty of gimmicks and unique ways to interact with the levels, like by taking advantage of the elevation to snipe enemies, you can also knock enemies off and have the allies below shoot them on the way down, then you have your explosive barrels, switches that raise and lower platforms, stuff like that. But in terms of artistic design, it kind of feels like there should be more. Like, the majority of levels in the First Kingdom are just these streets with elevated areas and blocks for you to use as cover but they never really get more creative than that. Once you get into Marie's palace, it's more of the same stuff, just replace the blocks for cover with tables and chairs. I mean, there's even this one mission that takes place in a room with a giant wedding cake. Imagine being able to do something like knocking the cake down on top of the enemies or climbing on top of it and sniping the enemies from up there, but no, it's just part of the background. Don't get me wrong, there are cool gimmicks like this in the game, but it's mostly limited to the bosses. Like, for example, during Marie's boss fight, you can damage her by knocking exploding bouquets of flowers onto her, and then luring her into a spot to have a freaking bell dropped on her. But like I said, this is pretty much just limited to the bosses, and there are only four major boss battles in this game. Now, I don't know much about what went on during the development of this game, but I don't think it's unfair to assume that this game was... kinda rushed. I mean, don't get me wrong, it still feels like a complete game. I beat it in around 30 hours, and aside from a single crash during a cutscene, the game ran fine on my PC. But the aforementioned simplicity feels like a sign of rush development, especially toward the end. The level design gets better in the Second Kingdom, but after that, it gets a whole lot worse. You see all these creative landscapes in the first two kingdoms? Well, once you get to the third, it's just... blocks. I mean, the levels still play well, but... blocks? Really? Then what do you get in the fourth kingdom? More blocks. This looks like something that 14 year old me would have made in Minecraft, not something from a Persona 5 strategy game. The worst part is, you know how Tactica's story draws inspiration from famous historical revolutions? Yeah, the first kingdom is based on the French Revolution, with the main villain being based on Marie Antoinette. Then the second kingdom is based on the Meiji Restoration. And then the third is... some Japanese high school. Ah yes, the three most famous revolutions in human history. The French Revolution, the Meiji Restoration, and most important of all, the Japanese high school student rebellion thing. 
They couldn't have done something cool like the American Revolution, or the Cuban Revolution, or the Hadian Revolution. Instead, it's just some high school, and then the Fourth Kingdom is just Gear World. Again, this goes back to my theory about this game's rush development. I mean, it looks like they had plenty of time to come up with creative scenarios for the first two kingdoms, along with the symbolism that the series is known for. They probably just didn't have time to come up with anything creative for a third or fourth kingdom, so they just did what they do best and put it in a high school setting. If that's true, then great job on not only throwing something together in such a short amount of time while still making the game feel mostly content rich, but also for prioritizing the gameplay above all else, because the missions are still fun. But now that brings me to the story. In my impressions video, I said that the game's story didn't really do a good job of making me interested at the start, but I did say it could get better. And does it? Yes, it does. A lot better, in fact. In that video, I mentioned a Japanese politician went missing at the start of the game. Well, he's one of the first characters you meet inside the First Kingdom. I was expecting him to be just another rotten adult that's reluctant to work with the Phantom Thieves and only does so out of necessity and ends up betraying them later on. But no, they didn't do that. They actually did the opposite, and Toshiro is now one of my favorite spin-off characters. I don't want to spoil too much, but basically the game's world with the kingdoms is all born from Toshiro's cognition as what I can best describe as a mega palace. Each of the kingdoms and their masters are connected to important figures from Toshiro's life. And as you play, you learn more about his backstory, and he has one of the most relatable backstories of any character in the franchise. Toshiro has to wrestle with the fact that he's a victim of abuse and manipulation, and wants to rebel, but doesn't have the courage to do so. He has to come to terms with the fact that, in his desperation, he did make some decisions that weren't exactly ideal. But we all make mistakes. We're all human. And I imagine most of us probably would have done many of the same things if we were in Toshiro's shoes. That's something Toshiro has to learn the hard way. And he's one of the best written characters in the series and has a really good story arc with some of the strongest development. Through him, the game even addresses some of the potential consequences about, well, the Phantom Thieves that weren't really brought up in Persona 5 or any of its other spin-offs. It's also a breath of fresh air because not just Persona, but Anime and JRPGs are known for stereotypically portraying politicians as these one-dimensional bad guys that don't care about anyone else and are obsessed with power and personal gain. But Toshiro shows that's not always the case. It helps to create one of the most relatable and mature stories in the Persona series, and it's kind of ironic because this is the only Persona 5 spinoff that's rated T instead of M. There's also Arena, the obligatory new waifu who's not really all that interesting, basically just a hot-headed rebel, but there is a very cool way that she's tied into Toshiro's backstory. There's a lot more I want to say, but I don't want to spoil anything. I think you all need to play this game for yourselves. You also might have noticed that I haven't really said much about the Phantom Thieves themselves. While they are a big part of the game here, obviously, they're not really the focus in terms of story and character development, but with all the spin-offs and other media they've been in, they don't really need to be. This game kind of assumes that you've at least played Persona 5, which, you know, as someone who's played Persona 5 to death, I can appreciate this. But it will also be a bit jarring to anyone who plays this as their first Persona game. I'll also say this game did make me like Haru a lot more, not just because of how strong she is in battle, but also because she has some pretty good interactions with Toshiro, which I think helps her a lot especially seeing as how she kind of got the short end of the stick in terms of screen time in both Persona 5 and Strikers. The last thing I'll say about the story is that there is a twist at the end, which I think it's kind of dumb, and I saw it coming a mile away, but it doesn't ruin the entire experience. The art style is also something I was pretty mixed on when I started, but it did grow on me. I compared it to the art style of Persona Q, and a lot of people commented comparing it to the art style of Panty and Stocking, which... I can definitely see, but Panty and Stocking itself was inspired by a lot of classic American cartoons, and I think that's where Tactica gets its art style from. I personally prefer the chibi art style of Q, but having spent over 30 hours in Tactica, I've grown to appreciate Tactica's art a lot more, and it's definitely going to help this game age. Now, the music I like, but I don't know, to me it's just not as good as the other Persona 5 spin-offs, at least for the vocal tracks. and there aren't nearly as many songs that stand out to me. I actually vastly prefer the soundtracks without lyrics over the ones that do have them.
My final score for Persona 5 Tactica is a 7 out of 10. It's a good game and a great concept that is unfortunately hampered by what I can only assume is rush development. I'm not sure if it's worth spending $60 on, but it's definitely worth a rental and it's more than worth checking out on Xbox Game Pass if you have it. Well, that pretty much covers Tactica, so why is there still so much time left in the video? Because I still have to cover the DLC. You know, the one that adds Kasumi and Akechi to the game? Characters that are very popular but were completely absent from Strikers? I should mention for this part of the video I am strictly covering the Repaint Your Heart Story DLC. I am not going to waste any money on broken personas or weapons to make an already easy game even easier. First of all, unlike Soul Hacker's 2 story DLC where the content was awkwardly mixed into the main story, the one in Tactica is a standalone side story that can be started or finished at any point before, after, or during the main game. This is much better if you ask me, because, you know, if you play the game and decide you like it enough to buy the DLC later, you're not wasting your time with backtracking and fighting bosses you're extremely overleveled for. The gameplay is largely the same, but things have been streamlined even more to accommodate for its short length, and it's actually much more difficult than the base game. For one thing, there's no Velvet Room. Instead, every persona you find during battle comes with two skills, and while you level up faster, your level doesn't really matter because the personas you get from playing are going to be much higher level than you. You'll start seeing personas twice, thrice, up to four times your level at the end of the game. I only played through once, so I don't know if the personas and their skills are randomized, but I do kind of like this because you kind of just have to go with what you've got. The skill tree system is still there, and you also gain GP much quicker, but weapons are now just handed to you. They also removed the optional quests, and there are no more challenges for the missions either. What they did add, though, is a new gimmick. Paint. When you're standing on tiles covered in blue paint, you'll be resistant to enemy attacks regardless of whether or not you're in cover. And when you attack an enemy, your paint will splatter at the spot you attacked them in. Adversely, when enemies are standing in spots marked by the blue paint, they'll be vulnerable to critical hits regardless of cover. And when you're standing on the pink paint, that is the enemy's paint, you can't attack and all of the caveats I just mentioned apply to you. It's a pretty fun and interesting gimmick, and with these new rules, it does make some enemies that were only a minor nuisance in the normal game a lot harder to deal with here. The story is that you, Kasumi, and Akechi come across a strange graffiti mural in an alleyway. You all get sucked in, and suddenly you're all in early 2000s graffiti land, where the mouse people are being oppressed by paintball gun lady. Why? We don't know, although we do find more about her later, but that would be spoilers. We're joined by a mouse thing named Luca, who serves as our guy. While it is nice to have the royal trio back together, in fact it's kind of nice to have a story that's just the three of us, the story here just isn't that interesting. The new radical extreme aesthetic is more interesting than the actual story. The new characters, Luca and Guernica, just aren't around long enough and don't get enough development. It just feels like they're going through everything way too fast, and the whole thing can be beaten in around four hours. Yeah, I could maybe justify this if it were only $10, or maybe if it were included in the base game, I'd say it's easily worth the $60 price tag, but on its own, it is definitely not worth $20. Honestly, the best thing about the DLC side story is the music. It has a bunch of new soundtracks that aren't in the main game, and Look, I'm not trying to be critical of the game's soundtrack, but why is the music here so much better than the main game's music? Voice. 
Once you beat the game, you unlock some more optional challenge missions, although these are even more difficult than the ones in the base game. Here, you can't even choose your party members or their personas. Once again, you just have to make do with what you're given. You also unlock the ability to use Akechi and Kasumi during New Game Plus playthroughs of the main game, which is actually kind of cool. On its own, I give this DLC a 6 out of 10. I almost gave it a 5, but I decided to bump it up to a 6 because it does add some cool new features to the base game, and the music is just too awesome. But I only recommend you buy the Repaint Your Heart DLC. The other ones, don't waste your money. And even in this case, I'd still recommend waiting for a sale. At least the base game is on Game Pass, and if you have that, it's more than worth checking out. The $60 price tag, though, is debatable. But that's going to be it for this video. Let me know what you all think. Do you agree? Do you disagree? What do you all think of this game? Be sure to check out my other links in the description, and until the next video, I will see you all later.